All right, if you will turn in your Bibles now to Revelation chapter 9, if there's any children uh, who want to head off to Children's Church, it's time for that. We are in Revelation chapter 9, <clears throat> and I'll be reading the, uh, the, whole, the whole chapter here today. And uh, again, if you, if you want to take a pew Bible, if you don't have your Bible with you, turn to page 1033. Could somebody confirm that for me? I, I'm right. Okay, I've been assuming for a long time that I'm, we're accurate here with, with my Bible, so... I checked that a long time ago, so anyway, so yeah, page 1033, Revelation chapter 9. Let's read. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion, When it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and The noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold... Two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They, were, they, they wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails were like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, and bronze, and stone, and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. May God bless the ring of his word. Let's pray. Father, give us grace now. Give me grace to communicate. Give grace to the congregation to receive. Ultimately, you are the one that must communicate, Father, that uh, you will make this sermon better than it is. And uh, and you you will... do a mighty work in us here this morning. So, Father, we love you, we trust in you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 
I personally have always loved sports and competition. Growing up, I enjoyed both playing and watching sports. And when I was a kid, you didn't focus on just one sport as so many kids do today. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just not what we did in, in our day. You played football or soccer or both in the fall, basketball in the winter, and then baseball or tennis in the spring and summer. And it was very natural when I had sons that I passed along that love to them. I often coached their teams, and it was a lot of fun, especially, of course, when we won. <laughs> um, but there were, but, but I'm sorry, one of the greatest rewards of sports, uh, one of the greatest re rewards of sports, particularly team sports, is that added benefit of the lessons of life that it teaches you. There are things you can learn as a kid from being a part of a team that will help you in life when dealing with things that, that really matter. You can learn things like how to work with others, uh, to learn to trust others, to sacrifice for others, to manage conflict, to overcome adversity, to work hard, to submit to authority. And it was always rewarding as a coach to watch kids pick up on these life skills and really develop as a person. I've seen young boys at the beginning of a season who are shy and, and timid start to develop into men by the end of the season. Yet every once in a while, you would have that kid who just resisted. They joined the team with issues, like not being able to get along with people or blaming everybody else for their problems or not listening to the authorities in their life. And of course, I'd have to get on to them as coaches have to do with players from time to time. And they would blame another player, perhaps, or even me for what, whatever happened. Then I would have to explain things more clearly and discipline them in ways like making them run laps, throw in a little encouragement, of course, in there, and sometimes they would eventually get it. But sometimes there, were they were, there, was, there was just no getting through to a kid. No amount of chiding or encouraging was going to help them. Well, today... We've got a lesson in that in Revelation chapter 9. But the stakes are much higher. The stakes can't be any higher. It's, a, it's higher than, than life itself. We are looking today, of course, at chapter 9. And I think uh, this might be the largest chunk of Scripture we have covered in the book of Revelation thus far. Don't count on that continuing. We will probably cover all of chapter 10 as, as well, but then we'll will most likely slow down again after that. We are in the middle of the vision of the seven trumpets. Like the seven seals that we covered before, the first four trumpets seem to go together, and the last three trumpets seem to go together. The first four judgments for both the seals and the judgments, I'm sorry, for both the, the seals and the trumpets are about judgments that are taking place over the last 2,000 years since Christ died, rose, and ascended to heaven. And the last three do seem to be directed more towards the end, or at least both and. The, the last 2,000 years we see signs of what we see here in the 5th and 6th, but also they seem to be pointing to the end as well. And the reason I say that is because the 5th seal had believers praying for God to bring his final judgment on the world for its persecution of the church. Then the sixth and seventh seals involved God answering that prayer with the final judgment. So there seems to be parallels between the fifth seal and trumpet and the sixth seal and trumpet, which I'll explain further as we go along. So on the surface, chapter 9 seems to be about unbelievers who, like some of my hard-headed players, were chided by God with increasing warnings, yet they refused to heed those warnings and repent. Yet I think this is 
directed to believers as well because, as I've shared with you before, the book of Revelation is written to encourage Christians to persevere in their faith because they are going to be attacked by both persecution and temptation. And the call of Revelation, of the book of Revelation, is to be faithful to Jesus because he wins. In the end, he wins, therefore we win if we hold on to him, if we hold on to our faith. And so with the fifth and sixth seal, the message was to persecuted saints that God will avenge them. And I think in the fifth and sixth trumpet, the message is to tempted saints to not give in to those temptations and to repent if they already have given in. So I'm going to follow the, the pattern we've, we've been in the last few weeks. I'm going to go through the whole passage and explain it and then come back and hit on some application. So let's, let's, let's jump in. Beginning there at verse 1 with the fifth angel blowing his trumpet and with that a star from heaven falls to the earth. Now I know a star fell with the third trumpet that we covered last week and we said that was symbolic of Nebuchadnezzar and the idolatrous leadership of nations that he represents that does not that does that, I'm sorry that does such harm to the lives of the people that they lead. We think it symbolizes Nebuchadnezzar because of the scripture reference in both Jeremiah 51 and Isaiah 14. Yet, as I mentioned before, with Isaiah 14, it is believed that that passage may also allude to Satan as the day star that tried to be like God and fail, which makes sense in seeing Satan behind all of these ungodly leaders of the world. Not that these ungodly leaders are possessed or anything like that, just very much tempted and manipulated by Satan. And so I think that's who this is here, uh, this, this, fallen, this, this, this fallen star. To back that up, he is fallen, and according to verse 11, he is an angel, and according to verse 1, he is given the key to the bottomless pit. So to me, it sounds very much like Satan. Regardless, though, of who he is, in verse 2, he opens the shaft of the bottomless pit, and a thick, dark smoke rose that darkened the sun and the air. And then somehow from the smoke came locusts on the earth. Now, where do these locusts come from? Well, <clears throat> you see, listen closely. With the start of World War III and the Battle of Armageddon, there's going to be these attack helicopters coming out of China, swarms of them, and it's going to be a major battle, and that's what John is describing here. I hear your chuckles. You, you get where I'm going with that. Just a little, little joking. Uh, so, even though, so even though that's what some believe, uh, I would say instead of a modern sci-fi movie, these locusts come out of the Old Testament. These, these locusts don't come out of a modern sci-fi movie, but out of, out of the Old Testament. They come first from Joel chapters 1 and 2. In Joel 1, the prophet refers to a locust infestation that devastated Israel. And in chapter 2, he uses that invasion of locusts to prophesy of a future army of the Lord that will bring judgment on Israel if it doesn't repent. But then going back even further, there's again the plagues of Exodus that the seven trumpets seem to be mimicking. Uh, in Exodus 10, God sent the eighth plague on Egypt consisting of an army of locusts that ate up all the vegetation. Yet in verses 3 and 4, we see that these locusts are different. They are like scorpions with power to hurt people instead of vegetation. In fact, in verse 4, they are commanded not to harm the grass, plants, and trees of the earth. Instead, they are to harm those who, quote, do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now remember back from chapter 7, before God allowed judgment on the earth, he put a seal on the forehead of his people, those he chose to show grace to and save from their sins through his son, Jesus Christ. And this seal guarantees 
They survived God's judgment on the earth not a physical survival, but a spiritual survival where they believe in Jesus and hold on to their faith through all the difficulties that God's judgment brings on the world. But for those outside of Christ, outside of his saving grace, they are then left on their own to endure God's judgment and in particular to be tormented by these locusts. Verse 5 says they were tormented for five months. Five months is actually the normal life cycle of a locust. But these aren't literally locusts, so the point of mentioning five months must be that the Lord puts limitations on how much pain they can afflict on people. Verse 6 shows it will still be horrific. People will seek death but will not be able to find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Yet this judgment is limited by God, and it will stop short of death. So exactly what kind of torment, then, is this that uh, is being described here? Well, if, if we look at another reference to torment in this section of Revelation, I think we get a clue. In Revelation 11, John sees a vision of two prophets who will come and preach. But then these prophets are going to die. And in chapter 11, verse 10, it says, quote, and those who dwell on the earth, remember that phrase, those who dwell on the earth, is code for unbelievers, all right? So for the unbelievers on the earth, they will rejoice over them, over these dead prophets, and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. They have been a torment to unbelievers. Now, how are they a torment? Well, it's clearly not a physical torment, although I'm sure prophets from time to time wanted to slap a few people upside the head. Uh, Preachers don't feel that way, but, you know, uh, maybe a few prophets would. But anyway, um, but, but yeah, No, it sounds like, obviously it could be physical, so it it sounds like it must be mental or emotional anguish, doesn't it? Another clue comes from Deuteronomy 28, where the curses God promised Israel for disobedience also included things like madness and despair. So it's believed that this is the kind of torment being talked about here. It doesn't kill but it drives a person to the point of wanting to die. It's the mental and emotional anguish of not being right with God. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not conviction. It's not conviction of sin. It's just the reality of not being right with God. God. The darkness that covers the soul and can make people long to escape life itself. If they can't find the strength in the midst of their despair to go through with ending it. And this torment is coming as a result of these locusts that come from the bottomless pit, the abyss. So I think it's fairly clear that these locusts have to be symbolic of demons. Demons who were bound in the abyss, tormented themselves, but allowed by God to be released by Satan and to the world to afflict the non-elect. And let me add, in parallel with the fifth seal, where the saints are tormented with the mental and emotional anguish of persecutions, I think we see here in the answer to their prayers that the world is being, being tormented as well. As, as, as the Lord tells them in the fifth seal that they're going to have to wait a while for the final judgment, at the same time in this fifth trumpet here, I think the Lord is saying that while you wait, understand that these people who are tormenting you, persecuting you, Christians, who believe in me, that they are not going to enjoy it. That they will face their own torment. The torment of being separated from me, being lost and bearing their own sin. 
think there's a clear parallel there. Verses 7 through 11 then give them more of a description. Richard Foster says the golden crown symbolizes victory over their enemies. Their human faces represent human cunning. Hair like a female suggests seductive powers and lion's teeth for the destruction they cause, the destruction of souls. Their iron breastplates show how indestructible they are. And scorpions are like snakes, hostile to man. Their king is the angel of the bottomless pit, Satan himself, and his name means destroyer in both Hebrew and Greek. This is the first woe, with two to go. That brings us to our sixth angel and his trumpet in verses 16 through, I mean, 13 through 19. And what we see is an increased intensity in judgment. Upon the, the blowing of the trumpet, a voice is heard from the four horns of the golden altar before God. Again, this is the parallel here. This is the same altar that the saints were under when they lifted up their prayers in the fifth seal in chapter 6. It is the same altar where the angel in the seventh seal lifted up incense with the prayers of those saints asking for God's vengeance on the world for its persecution. And now from that altar comes the command to release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, remember again in chapter 7, there was an interruption in the story. As God was pouring out judgment, then there's an interruption, a, like a little uh, parenthesis there. And it says that there were four angels, each standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of judgment that God was getting ready to unleash. They were holding back the judgments while God's elect were sealed with his grace and protection in Christ. So I think the four winds there parallel these four angels who are bound. They are now released to kill a third of mankind. They're no longer just mentally and emotionally tormenting. Now they will kill. With, with them, according to verse 16, were troops that were essentially without number. I mean, twice 10,000 times 10,000, that's 200 million. Uh, there's this, the world has never seen an army like this. It's just speaking of a number too many to count. And the horses of these troops are described with breastplates of the color of fire, sapphire, and sulfur. These colors uh, signify or simply signify the fire, smoke, and sulfur coming from their mouths. One of the clear images uh, John, John's vision is drawing on here, I think, comes from Genesis 19, when God brought judgment down on Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 19, verse 24, it says, The Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And then in verse 28, it says, And he, being Abraham, looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So you see there, fire, sulfur, smoke, and there's a picture there that we see in verse 2. When the bottomless pit was opened, it speaks of like the smoke of a great furnace. I think that is the image John has there. Then in verse 18, it says a third of mankind was killed by the fire, smoke, and sulfur coming out of their mouths. You get the idea, I think, that it's deception they're talking about there because what was killing them was coming out of their mouths. So people are dying by the mouths of these demons that attack them with lies. People being lies that, in, that brings about their destruction their death. And again, as the locust had a sting like a scorpion, these horses had tails like serpents, that, that ancient foe of mankind. But then we come to the crux of the matter with these two trumpets. 
when, when we hear shocking, the shocking words of verses 20 and 21. After all that we just read, after all we just read, all the terribleness, the, the misery, the woes, says the rest of mankind, that two-thirds that survived, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. After seeing a third of the world killed under God's judgment, they refused to repent. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, isn't it? So, just so we are clear, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says those who worship idols are actually worshiping demons so you see the connection here as well with john that demons are behind the idols and idols aren't necessarily objects of precious metals or stone or wood it's anything anything that we worship over the one true god it's what we give honor or importance to over the value and worth of god we can make self or other people or activities or objects of any kind into idols. John also mentions specific works of the hand that were not repented of, murder, sorceries, sexual immorality, and theft. As Jesus taught, this doesn't have to be literal to be considered the same. We murder with our hearts when we hate. We are sexually immoral when our eyes lust after anyone other than our spouse. The world is deceived into these things, and it clearly leads to bondage and death. But despite that, the world refuses to repent. And so in summary, we see that God is bringing judgment on this world. In the first four trumpets from last week, we saw that some of, the, some of God's judgments affect everyone living in the world. Whether you are a Christian or not, God is inflicting judgments on this fallen world that brings hardships on everyone. Christians today face natural disasters or bad governments as much as anybody. Yet then, as we see in the fifth and sixth trumpets, there are judgments that God is directing in this world, particularly on unbelievers or those who ultimately are proven to be the non-elect. God allows the demonic world to go forth and inflict both mental and emotional torment on people as well as death. I think it's clear that we can see evidence of this throughout history Yet at the same time, particularly in how the fifth and sixth seals and the fifth and sixth trumpets parallel each other, that much of this could be pointing to the very end of time as well, the events of the end. I don't think we can be precise or exact on this, so I will avoid that. But there are still plenty of lessons to take from, from this passage. So I want to hit on some of those applications now. First of all, there is a great deal of despair in our world that results from living in rebellion against God. And I think the Bible gives us two reasons. One clearly in this passage. I'll start with the other one first. I think as you look at the Bible as a whole, the Bible, is, it, Bible shows that, that man was not created to bear sin. Man was not created to bear sin, to bear guilt, to bear shame. Just like if you ate something that your body was not meant to digest, it can cause harm to your body. In the same way, when we were not created to bear sin, and so when we seek to bear our own sin, it will wreak havoc on us. It will wreak havoc on our, on our souls. And so... So with unbelievers, people 
people, as you see today, people living in, in, in middle anguish or, or emotional anguish. It is a result of them seeking to, to, to bear their own sin. It doesn't matter if they're an atheist or not. The, the, the result is still going to be there. As we see in, 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 Rev, in Romans chapter 1, that people seek to suppress the truth about God, to seek to su- suppress the truth about their own sin, but it does not matter. God will still bring the effect on them, uh, them bearing their own sin. It will cause harm to them. Something we need to, to remember about that is, is that we, we as, as Calvinists, as, as Reformed people, when we think about an unbeliever, uh, oftentimes we think of the inability for them to believe. And it, and it is an inability to believe. They're, they're spiritually unable to believe and understand without the grace of God being given to him, them to believe. But I would argue, and I think Romans 1 argues, is that the source of the inability is moral. That the reason they are unable to believe the truth, to see the truth, and believe it is because of their the 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 they're, they're natural, born with, because of their sin, born into this world with a hatred towards God. They do not want God and therefore are unable to consider and see the truth. I mean, it still results in the same thing, inability. But it is, it is, it is, it is ultimately a, a moral issue. And so you have these people living in this world, denying the truth, suppressing it, uh, but, it does, it, but, but the same result comes is they are in misery emotionally, uh, mentally, because they are seeking to bear their own sin, whether they realize it or not. But then, of course, the, the other reason, the other cause we see here is, again, I believe, God answering the, the prayers of the saints in, in that fifth seal, Showing, showing them that even though they go through great mental and emotional harm for the persecution that they are receiving from the world, that as, as they wait on that, that final vengeance to come and the final judgment, the Lord is showing them, showing us that the world will not enjoy the affliction, the affliction they are placing on you, that he will pour out his judgment on them and bring middle, mental and emotional anguish on them as well. God is pouring out his wrath on an unbelieving world. And so there we find, folks, the reason we have so many people struggling with mental and emotional issues. It seems to be, of course, an epidemic in, in our day. And people seek other pleasures to overcome their despair. But nothing ultimately works because they are bearing something they cannot bear and God is inflicting judgment on them. If there's anyone here who is not a Christian and you are unhappy, the Bible has the reason. You're seeking happiness in all the wrong places. The peace you long for comes only, only through Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus that God will remove his wrath from you. It is only through Jesus that that burden of sin and guilt is taken away and you don't have to carry it anymore. That is when the mental and emotional burden can be lifted is when we believe in Jesus Christ. Yet then someone may ask, well, why are so many Christians, why do so many Christians seem to struggle with mental and emotional problems as well? And I don't want to give too simplistic of an answer to this. Perhaps some of you have struggled with depression or other disorders. And I acknowledge that there can be certain physical factors involved. Living in a fallen world means that our bodies are fallen. And, you can, and, that, and that can involve our minds as well. Our minds are part of our, our body. At the same time, somebody may have gone through some really significant trauma so that it caused some deep scars that, that is, it takes a long time to get over. That can be a reality as well. So there's, there's that. And we as a church 
uh, sympathize and do not condemn those struggling with, with those types of things. Having said that, though, the problem for most Christians who struggle with mental or emotional health is that we seek after the world more than we do Christ. We seek after the world more than we do Christ. We can't know the peace of Christ if we do not treasure Christ. And we can't treasure Him if we do not know Him. And we can't know Him if we do not know His Word. He tells us we will find Him in Jeremiah 29 if we seek Him with all our hearts. Yet we don't. We find that seeking Him is not easy. It requires us to fight off other desires and temptations, to deny ourselves, to actually have some discipline in our lives, perhaps even face the frown and rejection of others. So we follow the example of the world and try to fill ourselves with temporal pleasures. And then we too often open ourselves up to demonic attack. By living in sin, we invite the destroyer, the accuser, to point out our own guilt, and we then spiral further and further into our own despair. Sin creates more, creates more, creates more despair, creates more despair, It becomes a spiraling thing. We believe the deception that comes forth from the demonic locusts and horses. Yes, they are sent to torment and kill the non-elect. Yet, what that means is that they actually have power over the non-elect to defeat them. We know from Ephesians 6 that they certainly attack believers as well. But, as Ephesians 6 says, we have the power to rebuke them with the seal of the Holy Spirit and the word of the Spirit, the gospel. So, folks, we must not make excuses. Even even if you've been diagnosed professionally, even if you know you've gone through something that had scars, you don't want to live your life with that crutch. And I'm, that didn't sound good either. There's hard things. I'm not denying that. These are hard things. You, God maybe have given you a, something that others don't have. Others have it easier. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying still there is victory, victory to have in Christ. His grace is powerful. Do we believe that? Do we believe His grace is powerful and can transform and can heal? Then we don't ever want to allow anything to to us to be diagnosed or anything that that says we can never have what someone else has. We can never experience and know the joy that another Christian has because I've got this. Now that may be. That may be that you never get... You feel what other people feel. You may always struggle to a certain extent. Great men of faith have struggled with things like depression, like Charles Spurgeon and others. But we still don't don't just accept that. We believe we are completely saved by grace, that he loves us just as much as the person who just seems to be sky-high joyful all the time. We believe in his absolute grace on us, that we are loved just as much. And with that, we, we, we seek him. We don't make excuses. We seek Him. We believe His promises. And we pray. And we ask. And we seek to live a free people. A free people. And not a tormented people. That's first. The call of this vision is also for Christians to persevere in the midst of the ongoing rebellion of this world. There is a reason that most people hear the gospel and still reject it, and who see the warnings of God all around them in His judgments yet still do not change. There is a reason 
Christians have to suffer or go without, or go without for a while, while others seem to, to fare better. And it is not because, it is not because we are wrong about Jesus and going through trials of different kinds unnecessarily. No, this world and the events of this world and the people of this world are going exactly according to God's plan. That's what we're being told here. Warning signs from God that seem clear to you will be ignored by others right up to the bitter end. Say, how can, I, how can this be true if so many people don't see it and, and, and just, they just keep in their unbelief all the way to the end? Because God said it was going to happen that way. He's sovereign. Ultimately, the only way they can turn is His grace, His sovereign grace. So no, this vision here is showing here that no, we don't need to doubt. Even though things go wrong, it seem to go terribly wrong, people just outright denying. No, it is all part of what God said would happen. Most, most heartbreaking. Most heartbreaking is that some of those people will be people you deeply love. People, you know, and that's so hard to understand. People you love, that you, if, you know, family that you connect so much. I mean, that you, you, you connect with on so many levels. As much as you try to connect with people in the church, you just feel a comfort with this, these family members. And uh, you just feel this connection with them on so many levels, but the, mo- but the deepest of all, the most important of all, Jesus. And they will just love their idols and their sin of the flesh Too much to turn to Christ and be saved. It is one of the greatest ways I think Christians suffer in this world. To know the eternal separation that's going to occur between us and our loved ones. Because they continue to reject. Reject to the end. But their denials and even their attacks do not mean you are wrong. It is all part of God's judgment on this world. And so we must be faithful and persevere and continue to point people to Jesus until we draw our last breath. We must tell them that Jesus died on the cross to cover the guilt and shame of our sin against God. And for all who put their trust in Jesus and turn from their sin, they are forgiven and saved. That should always be our cry. And ultimately, they may not be of the elect. Ultimately, they may be found not to be sealed by God. But you see, folks, we don't have the ability to know that. Only God can know that. And so we continue to plead for them. And it may come to a point where you realize you've said all you can say. You have shared with them, and now it's got to the point where it's gotten really testy, and they don't want to hear anything else from you. Well, fine, but we pray. We pray. Not only that, maybe we can fast. Fasting is, a, is a, essentially a physical way of praying of earnestly saying to the Lord, we are depending on you. Only you can do this. So I'm denying myself for the sake of my brother because I want him to know you. I want you to save him. So I am praying and I'm doing without because that's all else I can do because he won't listen to me anymore. We keep holding out hope, trusting the Lord. He ultimately knows He ultimately knows, and that's where we have to leave it. We know we can trust Him. Yet, as I said in the outset, the book of Revelation is written as a word of encouragement and hope for believers. We must persevere as we face persecution. But perhaps far more often, 
we face temptation. We face a lot more temptation than we do persecution. Am I right? As John records the shock of those in verses 20 and 21 who refused to repent after experiencing the torment and death of the fifth and sixth trumpets, the subtle reminder is for us not to be found in that group. To do as 2 Peter 1.10 tells us, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. And we confirm it by doing what the non-elect could not do. We repent of idolatry in our lives. We repent of the works of our hands that dishonors God. To repent means we... It doesn't mean we just feel bad about it and ask God to forgive us. That's certainly part of it. There should be great remorse. There needs to be. But it also means we turn from it. We stop it. We cut it off. We do whatever it takes. We tell another trusted believer who could hold us accountable. We don't make excuses or blame other people. We own it. We own it. Folks, we can do that because we have a God and Savior who does not condemn those who repent. <laughs> who actually took the condemnation on himself for us. And he loves and he forgives and he restores. We could come to him in repentance knowing he turns no one away who comes to him in faith. Not works, but in faith. Humble trust in his mercy. And this great Savior has a church who does the same thing for one another when we repent before each other because we are all trusting in that same mercy. Because of that, we have to show mercy towards one another despite how great the sin might be. We all need it. We all need mercy. And so we're there for each other. So we got to do this got to do this because the alternative is eternal death. Holding on to our sin out of fear will result in our destruction. When I say out of fear, that's what we're doing. You see, a lot of our sin, a lot of those idols are, are, are things that give us comfort, strength of some kind. Whether it's sexual, whether it's money, whether whatever, it could be lying. You know, somebody lies a lot because it allows them to kind of get out of stuff or cover up stuff. So they get, they get comfort. They, they feel some safety in being able to turn to that sin to protect them in this life. They're afraid, so they're holding on to these things for survival. And so what has to happen for repentance is that we see that we've got someone we can trust in, that we can let go of those, those, those things. We might, be, we might be scared, shaken, holding on to those things. And the gospel says you can let go because you've got Jesus who while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were saying, we don't want you, God, that's when he died for us. <laughs> he chose us before the foundation of the world, knowing our sin, knowing what we would do to him. In light of that grace, in light of that love, we can let go of this stuff. We can let go of it. 
trust Jesus. The unbeliever needs to hear that, but we believers need to hear that as well. You're holding on to stuff. You're holding on to stuff. It's Jesus plus my survival kit. My personal kit of idols and other works of the hand that get me through life to allow me to cope. And you got to let go of that. You got to turn from it and trust Jesus. And we can do that because Jesus came to save sinners. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your glorious grace. When we read of the judgment that is coming on this world, it can make us shudder to see what we deserve for our sin against you. Thank you, Father, for pouring out your grace on us. Thank you for Jesus covering all of our sin. Thank you for the the clear testimony of love that is given to us. That shows us we can trust you with everything. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Whatever we have to give up. You will take care of us in the end. You win. Because of that, because of us being in Christ, we win. Thank you, Father. Give us grace to believe that, to live it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.